I want you to turn with me to the 16th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. Oh, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the time? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Isn't that strange that Jesus would say the only sign would be of the prophet Jonah? And many people don't believe that Jonah lived in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. And Jesus was describing that he would be in the earth three days and three nights when he was crucified. And he believed it. He believed in all these things that some of us seem to doubt today that's in the Word of God. I believe this Bible from cover to cover. I don't understand it all, but I believe it. I believe it's the inspired Word of God. In Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus gave us a 94-verse scenario of how the world would look at the time of his coming again. The Bible teaches from one end to the other that Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth again. He left in a cloud. The disciples gathered around and they were sorrowing because their friend was going. But he told them that he was going to return. And they asked some questions about it. C.S. Lewis, the great Oxford and Cambridge scholar, said that there are three reasons people don't want to believe it. First, they, it did not take place as the early church predicted. They kept asking, why hasn't Christ come so far? And this, of course, is precisely what the apostle Peter predicted. He said, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. Notice they willingly are ignorant of it. Later in the chapter, Peter writes, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall come to pass, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all manner of life and godliness? Yes, the Bible teaches that Jesus is coming back and that we're to look for him and we're to live for him. The theory of in inevitable progress keeps many from believing. If we believe that everything is progressing by itself, we will never accept the promise of Christ's coming. And then the third reason he gave is, this teaching cuts across the plans and dreams of millions. You see, we want to eat and drink and be merry without interference in your selfish course of action. The fact of his return is settled. He's coming. We don't know exactly when, but we can see some signs and evidences of the fact that his coming may be near. It's certainly nearer than when he predicted it. What are some of the signs of the coming again of Christ? The first thing that, that is listed is false Christ. There'll be people coming in the name of Jesus claiming to have all the answers and we have so much of the occult today wherever you turn. Now Jesus warned that there would be wars and rumors of wars before he came. And we've had two world wars in this century and we see on the front pages of our papers every day the most horrible stories of what's taking place in the war in Yugoslavia. Just as bad almost as anything Hitler ever thought of. The intensification of war is not in itself a sign of the end. 
but only a sign that the end is approaching. It's one of the signs that Jesus left. And then he listed famine. In the 20th century, we've seen the greatest famines in history. Did you know that? The greatest famines in the history of the world have come in this century. Our TV program the other night was entitled The Race to Save the Planet. And it said that it's a race in which humanity is losing. We look on our television screens and we see those scrawny little children and their bloated stomachs. And we know that hundreds and thousands are dying every year from starvation. We have no idea what is in store for the human race unless Christ comes back and changes all of it and he's going to do it. And then he says that it's going to be preceded by pestilence in spite of all the advantages of modern medicine and pe pesticides the 20th century has had the greatest epidemics. Can you imagine what's going to happen when the whole human race is exposed to HIV and AIDS and herpes grips the human race? How wild people are going to be? How mad they're going to be? How the death is going to be so prevalent from these diseases? These are the pestilences that Jesus predicted are coming unless something happens. And then Jesus predicted there's going to be martyrdom. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Christians, religious people, will betray each other. The scripture says, Jesus said, there's going to come a time when there's going to be suffering among the people of God. I don't think many of you here today would be aware of how strong the anti-God movement is throughout the world. Revelation 7 speaks of a great multitude which no man can number from every kindred, tongue, and nation who have gone to heaven having sealed their testimony with their own blood. Many believers are dying in this century because they believe in Christ. Then there'll be the loss of love, of fervent love, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. By this shall all men know that you're going to heaven because you love one another. Do you love each other? Regardless of the color of the skin, regardless of the language, we ought to love each other. And if there's one thing that I would like to leave behind in this crusade is that you love each other. We need to come together. And we can come together, but I think we can only come together in Christ. I don't see anything else in the world that'll bring us together spiritually like faith in Christ. Then Jesus said another sign will be people will begin to live as they did in the days of Noah. How did they live in the days of Noah? They lived very immoral lives. They exchanged wives. They did all kinds of things that we read about in our newspapers and see on our screen and God judged them and brought a flood that destroyed the then known world except eight people. And God promised Noah, Noah, I'll never do it again with a flood. The next time it's going to be with the fire. Was he talking about the atomic bomb then? We don't know. But I know one thing. Noah escaped that terrible judgment because he had faith in God. And he put his faith and his confidence in God and God spared him. And Noah, it says, was a preacher of righteousness. He went out in the streets and proclaimed Christ or proclaimed God to the people of that generation. And God honored him and blessed him. 
And then he said something else is going to be a sign that he's coming is soon. The proclamation of the gospel throughout the world. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all the nations, and then shall the end come. And for the first time in history, the gospel is now being proclaimed through television and radio and missionaries all over the world. There's nowhere in the world today that you can't pick up a radio and listen to the gospel. Yes, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Now, what are going to be the results of the coming of Christ? Man is going to be held accountable. It'll be examination time. You'll stand before God to give an account of your life. You'll give an account of your thoughts, your intents, your purposes, your actions. You'll give an account. And many of us are not going to pass that exam. I heard about an old woman that was reading her Bible and somebody asked one of her grandchildren, what is your grandmother doing? She said she's getting ready for her finals. And that's what we all better be doing, is getting ready. And you get ready by being sure that Christ lives in your heart. There are thousands here tonight that don't know that Christ lives in your heart. You're not sure of it. You're not certain of it. You go to church. You've been baptized. You might have been confirmed. You live a fairly decent life. But deep inside, you don't know Christ. You're not certain of it. You'd like to be sure. Well, before we leave here today, you can be sure. And then there'll be worldwide justice. But let me tell you, there's one coming that's going to have the power to release you from all of the evil and all the things that are binding you and holding you and all the troubles and things that you've been going through. There's release in Christ. And then there'll be safety and security. They shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. What a glorious time it's going to be. You won't have to worry about the economic conditions. You won't have to worry about losing a job. You won't have to worry about your income. It'll all be taken care of. Christ is coming back to do all of that. But we must have faith in him. And then the Bible says, there'll be no more wars. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, and nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That's actually going to take place. This earth is going to become a planet of peace, but only under the direction of Christ. Why can't we put our trust in him now? Why do we have to wait till then when it will be too late for you as an individual? Because outside of Christ, you're lost. You need Christ. And then the world is going to believe in Christ because he'll be sitting on his throne and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What a day that will be. There'll be universal joy and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. There's going to be joy someday and those things will not bother us anymore. Nothing lasts forever except the kingdom of God. Are you sure that you're in that kingdom? If you are, then you're going to last forever with him and there'll be universal joy forever in your heart. I'm going to ask you today to surrender your life to Christ to make sure. We've seen several thousand people this past week do what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat. I know it's warm, but it's cooling all the time. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front here and say to, today, I want to make sure that I know Christ.